As a preface to this tape about my experiences with the 10th Mountain Division, uh, let me say that um, I have had to put this together myself. Uh, when Debbie Gamar of the Denver Public Library asked me to do so, um, we quickly found that there was no experienced questioner uh, within a reasonable distance of where I live uh, who could come and uh, uh, conduct the interview. Uh, consequently, uh, I have done the best I could to uh, respond to all of the uh, seven questions that Debbie recommended uh, to the, the uh, interviewer should use. My experiences were not nearly as exciting or harrowing uh, as many of those of my colleagues. Uh, I was very pleased that Debbie asked me to do this. My name is Durye Morton. I was with the 10th Mountain Division during the Second World War. Initially with L Company 90th Regiment uh, from September 1943 to February 1944. At that point on the 17th of February I was transferred to the 85th Regiment uh, E Company, uh, 2nd Battalion, 2nd Platoon. Uh, and I was with them from that date until the uh, division was deactivated in uh, November of 1945, as I remember. Um, then I was shipped to Camp Campbell, Kentucky, uh, to wait out my point accumulation. At that point, we were expected to uh, start basic training again, and I took a dim view of that and applied for and was given the job uh, as one of the battalion clerks which I held until I was discharged on uh, February 2nd, 1946 at Indiantown Gap in Pennsylvania. Now, how did I find out about the 10th Mountain Division? Well, I'd been skiing since I was 11 years old in the foothills of the Berkshires in Connecticut and was a member of the National uh, Ski Patrol. And during that period, of course, the Finns were attacking the Russians by sneaking out at night from the woods or the forests of Finland and uh, wreaking havoc with the Russian troops and then disappearing back into the vastness of the uh, uh, forests of Finland. Uh, this was a very exciting and romantic uh, notion for a lot of us. And uh, when I read the, in the uh, uh, Ski Patrol news that uh, Minnie Dole was looking for uh, uh, people interested in the outdoors and skiers and woodsmen and rock climbers and so on, um, I wrote and asked for information about it. I received that material and sent my application and my three letters of recommendation in uh, to the Ski Patrol uh, near the end of my uh, high school senior year. I then went on to uh, start college and in the middle of the summer of that uh, first semester I received the okay uh, in the form of a postcard from the National Ski Patrol signed by Minnie Dole indicating that I was to report to Camp Hale as soon as I had been processed at the induction center. Uh, there were all kinds of war regulations which superseded all the other regulations and required the reception centers to uh, follow the orders on the card. Upon my arrival at Indiantown Gap uh, for induction, I uh, went through the regular uh, course of KP and uh, shots and one thing and another and had presented my card from the ski patrol to the uh, sergeant in charge of our uh, induction group. Uh, and uh, it wasn't uh, very long before I was called uh, over to see an Air Force Colonel, or uh, an Air Corps Colonel, uh, who spent uh, several hours a day for three or four days trying to convince me that I should join the Air Corps and forsake the 10th Mountain Division. I held out. Uh, and uh, uh, in between times I was assigned to KP and spent uh, most of my time scrubbing huge uh, rolls of salami uh, and uh, cleaning off the, the uh, mildew or the mold that was on the outside before they were uh, cooked and, and served to the troops. Uh, eventually the uh, sergeant in charge of our group came to me and said, well, I'll see you in Camp Hale or Colorado. And so it was that I uh, was put on a train for Denver 
turns out that I was the only, only the second person at that point to go through uh, Indian Town Gap uh, and uh, be processed for Camp Hale. I arrived in, in Denver uh, after, I think, two days on the train, and uh, possibly three. I went to the bus station and uh, picked up a uh, bus, an old Rio bus, uh, very old-fashioned, and uh, joined others who were heading out to Camp Hale and uh, points beyond. Um, the real bus was rather interesting because the wheels, the rear wheels, were quite far in from the rear end of the bus. And this uh, uh, proved to be rather exciting for a number of people sitting in the back of the bus because as we went over Loveland Pass, there were points where the curves were so sharp uh, that the bus driver had to back and fill to get around the curve. And uh, very often, the, the rear end of the bus would be hanging over the abyss below and uh, cause no end of excitement for those sitting in the, in the back of the bus. Eventually, we arrived at uh, Pando, and I was dropped at the gate uh, on September 28, 1943 took basic training with the L Company, the 90th Regiment, and uh, uh, during that point I was given a Thanksgiving Day pass to uh, do with what I wanted, and so I was able to hop a freight uh, going down to uh, Glenwood Springs. I spent the night in the caboose and arrived in the early morning of Thanksgiving Day in 1943 in Glenwood Springs, spent the day wandering around, had a Thanksgiving lunch of sorts, and then uh, hitched a ride back to Camp uh, Hale with uh, a group of troopers uh, later that evening. Along with the rest of the division uh, at Camp Hale, I had the Pando Hack, which was a bad cough and stinging eyes uh, brought on by the soft coal smoke uh, burned in our barracks and the soft coal smoke coming from the um, locomotives going over Tennessee Pass. In December, the um, tank destroyer outfits um, were brought in uh, to fill out our, our uh, complement of soldiers. Uh, and uh, these boys had never seen snow or uh, mountains as tall as we had around Camp Hale and they all arrived in December wearing suntans, which uh, much to the delight and humor or laughter of uh, those of us who were there. They looked pretty uncomfortable and uh, it took them quite a while to acclimatize. Uh, but during that time we uh, continued our training and they eventually joined us. And uh, during our training later on, uh, when we were uh, at, uh, uh, at Cooper Hill, uh, some of us were asked to help the regular instructors uh, understand the basics of skiing, which we all did and which we enjoyed doing. Uh, the purpose of, of getting these boys up to speed was to make them uh, make it possible for them to ski in a column uh, without falling down and disrupting the column. In order to do this on some of the very steep areas, we had them use their skins uh, on the bottom of their skis, and this, of course, slowed them down uh, and gave them some maneuverability uh, when they were able to, uh, when they were going down the hill. Uh, we were tested uh, uh, by uh, the battalion uh, up on Resolution Ridge, about halfway up, and uh, we were able to get these fellows in column all the way down uh, without stumbling or falling in any way. At one point during our training, we were camped out in the middle of winter and uh, went into bivouac situation. Uh, one of the uh, groups uh, built a fire too close to a pine tree and all of a sudden that pine uh, just exploded in the most tremendous sound and um, flash of frame, flame. Uh, the uh, uh, pitch and the rosin from the pine itself caught fire and caused the explosion. After that, we were uh, warned 
very seriously not to build fires uh, at the base of a tree. During this time, there were passes to Denver and elsewhere when uh, our rotation came up. And uh, I hooked up with a, a group of, of men from various regiments to, who drove to Denver and was able to uh, get down there several times. I remember one memorable <coughs> period coming back from Denver late at night and we hit Loveland Pass and a terrific snowstorm to the point where we couldn't see the front of the radiator or the hood of the car. Uh, so we each took turns walking in front of the car trying to find the highway uh, up over the pass and we walked until we were, it was so cold we couldn't take it anymore and then changed off and we arrived back in um, at the camp about 3 or 3.30 in the morning uh, and of course we're up bright as a button um, uh, and uh, at Reveille. Um, I was promoted to uh, private first class on February 5th, 1944 and uh, uh, then at that point was transferred to E Company of uh, the 85th Regiment, 2nd Battalion, 2nd Platoon um, on the 17th. Uh, I neglected to mention that going to or going from college into the 10th Mountain uh, really uh, wasn't that much different. We had a highly motivated uh, people in the 10th Mountain and uh, really the only difference at least uh, uh, early on between college and the uh, activities of the 10th Mountain of course were our, was our drill but we all wore the same color clothes. Uh, otherwise, uh, the intellectual stimulation and interest in world affairs and activities uh, around the country and the, the world was, was uh, just about as, as uh, high as it was uh, during my short term at college. Uh, I trained in the 85th uh, and stayed with them right through uh, the war, as I indicated earlier. Uh, I trained with wonderful, wonderful men. Uh, our sergeant was uh, Nick Klimas, who uh, eventually, uh, when we, uh, just before we went to Texas, uh, he'd applied for OCS and was sent to Fort Benning. We did see him at one point down at, uh, in, in, in Texas uh, later on, and uh, he was eventually sent to France and unfortunately was killed uh, over there at that, uh, in one of the battles. Uh, in France, but um, uh, Floyd Simmons, George Miskey, Orville Herndon, Jack Verville, Eddie Gallant, Frank Smith, Frank Dunham, and many others were all good friends and we were all uh, very close in the course of our uh, training. Uh, one name does stand out uh, and it, for a strange reason as you'll see. Uh, this gentleman was named Maurice Morton. And of course, having the last name and uh, being a transferee uh, in uh, to the outfit, uh, the clerks in the office didn't always realize that there were two Mortons. And so when the name Morton was yelled, Maurice would answer, and he wound up doing all kinds of KP and guard duty and one thing and another. Uh, and eventually uh, the first sergeant caught on and I began to take my share. Uh, Maurice uh, was not very outdoor oriented, um, a very capable man, um, but uh, uh, he was really happier, I think, taking that. Uh, prior to the war, Maurice had worked for the William Morris Agency in, in uh, Hollywood. Uh, dealing with uh, registering and, and uh, hiring uh, movie stars and stage stars for a variety of productions. And uh, he went back to this after the war. Um, so after this little confusion was straightened out, why we eventually uh, went through uh, the uh, maneuvers, uh, the D series so-called, and my memories of that include uh, deep snow, uh, minus 30 degree temperatures, uh, sleeping in um, hollows of snow that we dug out and lined with uh, uh, spruce and pine branches and dumped our sleeping bag inside and would wake up in the morning covered with snow and climb out and uh, get ready for the day and the next maneuver. Um, the uh, uh, ice covered clothing on Easter Sunday, 
uh, on one of the passes, and I can't remember the name of the pass, but all of us were coated. Uh, there'd been a, a thaw and then a rain and then a sudden freeze, and we all were absolutely uh, just uh, stuck thick with ice, uh, which uh, is a memory I think many of us will have for the rest of our lives. Uh, the division was then uh, sent to Camp Swift, Texas in June of, I think around June of 1944, and um, uh, we were training there to learn how to fight uh, on flatland in desert conditions and also uh, against tanks and the m uh, machine gunners were being trained uh, to use heavy machine guns which are water cooled and would not obviously work in, uh, in the um, uh, mountains too well in the wintertime. Uh, one of the other things was that I was <coughs> trained as a flamethrower <coughs> and got involved in that for a while. And then uh, the regiment put out a call for um, buglers and drummers because they wanted to have a uh, drum and bugle corps uh, to um, uh, march in parades and so on for the regiment. Uh, I applied because I'd been a, a, played a cornet in high school and uh, uh, was eventually given a plastic, an OD colored plastic bugle, which uh, I used and we would train out on the drill field in the center of uh, Camp Swift and uh, <clears throat> then retire to the shade uh, to take a break and practice our various calls. One of the nice things about the uh, Drum and Bugle Corps operation was that they needed buglers for um, regiment, regimental activities and to call the troops for various activities. So that if you did that, uh, and then you did. You were assigned for that for a day, blowing reveille, uh, the mess calls, and all the other calls, uh, including taps in the evening. Uh, and they also uh, had weekend duty. If you got weekend duty, you started Friday afternoon and were finished uh, Monday morning. This meant that the following weekend you were automatically given a three-day pass, which uh, a number of us took advantage of. One of the nice things uh, about that was that we could get into town, into Austin, and enjoy uh, the, the movies and the museums and uh, activities at the university and so on, which was uh, a nice break from uh, the hot drilling and programs that we were involved in out in uh, at Camp Swift. Um, I can remember one time uh, I was regimental bugler and we were uh, out in front of uh, regimental headquarters ready for um, reveille or the, rather the retreat ceremony and um, officers lined up on either side and the uh, various companies in front of their barracks all ready to go and I played the call uh, to retreat and uh, the ceremony and the uh, Soldiers were at the flagstaff ready to pull the flag down and so on. And one of the things I should say is that the, uh, in those days there were no PA systems as such and we had a megaphone on a post. It was a metal megaphone about three feet long. And this, uh, you as a bugler, you would play uh, in three different directions. It was on a, the megaphone was on a, a, a swing kind of thing so that you could swing it back and forth. And you put the mouth of the bugle uh, or the bell of the bugle into the mouth of the megaphone and blow and it magnified the sound. And so I played to the left, to the center, and to the right. And then uh, on signal uh, from the officers at the correct moment was there, it began to um, play the retreat song or whatever. And as I did, three or four dogs appeared out from under uh, a nearby barracks and came over and walked around us and sat down right in front of me and proceeded to howl. Uh, this caused absolute um, consternation from the officers who could hardly control themselves and prevent themselves from laughing during this rather cer somber ceremony. How I got through it, I'll never know, but uh, the, the um, uh, 
crew at, at back at my company headquarters later on asked me what had happened and uh, because they said it was kind of a messed up uh, bugle call and of course when I told them they understood but it was uh, I, we had a, a number of uh, funny experiences like that and the officers never let me forget it that my bugling um, caused the dogs to howl and I had a reputation uh, for that. Uh, one night when I was on uh, a weekend uh, duty, uh, Friday night as I remember, uh, I uh, started playing taps and uh, finished the first bar and uh, one of the other regimental buglers across the drill fields echoed and the next thing we know we were playing echo taps and uh, as both of us who we never and we never met, both of us uh, uh, were on all weekend. We played it Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. And uh, uh, every once in a while, we would do it again. And when we found that we were uh, on it, one or the other would pick up the the echo, uh, and that was a very moving and, and wonderful experience. Now, at this point, uh, Maurice Morton, who I had mentioned earlier, uh, was transferred to the special services because they were going to produce a magazine uh, about the 10th Mountain. And he had uh, uh, editorial experience uh, with his work from, from William Morris, and so he, is, he wound up being one of the three, I believe, editors of that uh, magazine. We never, I never saw him again uh, after our Texas visit because I don't, don't know whether he went uh, uh, with special services overseas or not. Uh, among other things are my good friend Eddie Gallant, uh, a, a young fellow from Fitchburg, Massachusetts, a uh, very feisty young guy, was uh, in the regimental boxing uh, matches and uh, became regimental champion and then eventually went on. And I'm not sure whether he became divisional champion or not, but he certainly uh, was right up there in the semifinals. Uh, so this was good. Um, uh, as we got ready to uh, go overseas, and we knew that this was our final lead up to uh, the trip overseas, I was given the okay to take a 35 millimeter camera with me uh, with the stipulation that uh, I paint it uh, olive drab color, which I did. And as I was packing the camera in my duffel bag, the first sergeant came along and said, you can't take that with you. Uh, it will be shipped with our other equipment and you'll receive it as soon as you get overseas. Of course, you know what happened. I didn't get it until after the war was over and I was very lucky to uh, be given it at that point, uh, considering uh, all the traveling we'd done over in Italy. This was written up in a June 10th, 1945 issue of the Blizzard. In late 1944, we were shipped by train from Camp Swift Texas uh, to the Patrick Henry Embarkation Center in Hampton uh, Roads, near Hampton Roads, Virginia. Interestingly enough, that is only about 10 miles from where we're sitting right now um, and uh, has since been turned into a, uh, an airport. Uh, my impressions of, of the Patrick Henry uh, Embarkation Center are um, red, reddish buildings with yellow trim or yellow signs uh, around the area. Lots of rain and fog, uh, soft coal smoke, uh, which reminded us of the soft coal smoke uh, we breathed up in Camp Hale and the Pando Hack, which we all had uh, while we were up there. Uh, and uh, then uh, a very fast um, physical uh, to determine our uh, qualifications and our uh, physical health as far as going overseas was concerned. Uh, one day we were asked to uh, just wear raincoats, nothing underneath, and we marched over to a barracks where we went in single file on the double and uh, went past a, a group of doctors and paused briefly and uh, flashed, uh, did a frontal flash with our raincoats, then jogged a little further, turned around and did a rear end flash uh, in front of several other doctors, and then were whisked out the door. 
uh, as I remember, that was about the extent of the physical. After about a week or 10 days, uh, we were ready to ship overseas, and uh, around uh, January 4th, 1945, uh, we uh, went aboard the USS West Point, uh, which had been a luxury liner, the America, uh, prior to its uh, uh, work for the Army. Um, this was a very fast ship, and we did not need a convoy, uh, and we went by ourselves across the ocean. It was a very, very rough, rough crossing. Uh, I was in a, a room with about 12 or 15 other men, and we uh, stayed right in our uh, bunks throughout the trip, except for uh, going to meals. and. Uh, a lot of the men just didn't do that uh, because they were so seasick. Um, we zigzagged our way across uh, the ocean, and as we arrived in the Gibraltar vicinity, word was passed that uh, we were being shadowed by a submarine. Um, we all uh, donned life jackets and were ready to evacuate if necessary, but it turned out that it was an Allied submarine uh, just protecting us. As we went through the Straits and on over to Naples, we arrived in Naples on January 13th and uh, disembarked and immediately got aboard uh, LSTs uh, and took an overnight trip along the coast, up along the coast of Italy to Leghorn, uh, or as they call it, Livorno. And were then shipped by truck to various locations. And at this point, my memory is a little hazy because uh, we went to several different towns, but I do remember the first night I was assigned a billet with a group of other uh, fellows with an Italian family. And uh, I didn't speak Italian, still don't. Uh, no, none of the other soldiers that were there with me could speak Italian, so we sort of tried to con converse with the, the family, and it seems to me there was a mother and a father and, and uh, maybe a, a, a daughter and possibly a son. Uh, but in the course of, of uh, doing a variety of hand signals and one thing or another, the uh, father saw my plastic bugle, and he um, went to another room and brought out a bugle, and it turns out that he had been a bugler in the, as far as I could figure out, a bugler in the Italian army, and so we traded bugle calls back and forth for a little while that evening. In the morning, uh, as we were getting ready to uh, meet our, the rest of our platoon out in front of our billet, uh, I was waiting uh, and put my pack with the bugle attached uh, on the outside down on the snow. Uh, being plastic, as soon as it hit the snow, the bugle cracked into a number of pieces, and that was the end of uh, any attempt to carry a bugle with me. Although I'm really not sure why uh, I was supposed to take it uh, at that point anyway. Eventually, after two or three nights of this, we uh, were driven up to a, a, a small town uh, up in the mountains at the, at the sort of a dead end of a valley, and the little town was called Orsinia, and uh, O-R-S-I-G-N-E, I believe. <clears throat> we stayed there for about three weeks, or at least two and a half to three weeks. Um, and we did outpost uh, guard duty. The head of the valley uh, it was quite a deep, deep gorge next to the town uh, with uh, water coming off the mountain at the end of the valley, which was right next to where Orsini was located. Uh, ski dirt patrols were sent up the, to the top of the mountain from time to time, and uh, uh, also uh, back to regimental, regimental headquarters to maintain contact. One of the interesting things, um, we, never, we never did actually see the enemy, although a couple of times, and I was on one patrol uh, up on the mountain when we intercepted uh, three men on skis and their rucksacks were loaded with uh, jars and, and tins of olive oil. Uh, in the course of conversation, our, uh, uh, one of the fellows, um, name of Gasparini, 
um, who from Porchester, New York, was with us, and he spoke Italian very well, and he found out that these guys were taking this stuff, uh, the olive oil, over to the Germans on the other side of the mountain. So we rounded them up and uh, um, ran them back down to, to Orsini, where they were picked up and transferred back for questioning uh, elsewhere. We enjoyed watching the daily life, and uh, we all gathered around at various mornings to watch the uh, local men head down to the bottom of the gorge to crack rocks. And these rocks were used for building houses and things, and there were huge boulders down at the bottom, which they spent days cracking and so on. But the interesting feature was that they would uh, go with their wives and the wife would, be, wife would be walking, carrying food on her head for lunch, and leading the mule on which the man was sitting. And then at the end of the day, when they'd finished, they would be coming back up. The, the wife would be leading uh, the mule, carrying a huge rock on her head, and the man would be sitting on the mule. Uh, that entertained us no end. Uh, as we watch this day after day after day. Once or twice during our stay in Orsinia, uh, the locals uh, put on a dance for us, uh, which was very nice indeed. Um, there was a small town hall, uh, and uh, inside was a, an orchestra of sorts, a, an accordion, a violin, a horn, and a uh, um, drum. Uh, they did provide music, uh, and uh, it uh, was different, but danceable. Uh, we were invited in, and when we went into the room, the large room, uh, we found that the mothers were sitting in chairs uh, side by side all the way around the room. Uh, they were wearing black. Uh, their daughters uh, were wearing somewhat more colorful dresses, but were sitting on their mother's laps. Um, and we were invited uh, to uh, ask any of them to dance. And as we started across the dance floor toward uh, the girl we had decided to dance with, it was uncanny because that girl would get up even before we uh, indicated that we were interested in her and would walk toward us and uh, uh, then we met and danced. Uh, we never could figure out how they could uh, figure, figure out which one uh, we were going to ask, but they seemed to have a sixth sense. Uh, after the dance, each girl would go back to her mother, turn around, flip the back of her dress up, and sit down on her mother's lap. And she did this, apparently, so that the dress would not be wrinkled. Now, one of the girls on one of these dances uh, took quite a shine to Floyd Simmons. Uh, good friend of mine, and well, he, and she really made no bones about the fact that she wanted to have him uh, take her back to the United States so that she could have a washing machine and wouldn't have to wash clothes on the rocks in the town stream. Uh, one time while we were there, the cook asked us to forego our canned meat rations for three or four days. Uh, and uh, he collected them, didn't say what, what he was doing, but what actually happened was we came into the uh, uh, little building where we were having our uh, meals, and uh, here was this very ancient-looking Italian woman, busily uh, working with a knife and a uh, sapling branch about two feet long. She was whittling it off and taking off all the nubbins on the, where the little branchlets had been and eventually got it to her satisfaction. Then she uh, had this, there was an old wooden table that the chef or the cook had given her to use and she began to uh, make a flour mixture, a dough of some sort. And when she got it at the right consistency, she proceeded then to roll it out with this sapling. And she kept rolling it and rolling it and rolling it until it was thin as could be and stretched over the uh, sides of the table to the floor on all sides, just like a, an, a long tablecloth. Then the cook gave her a pair of scissors and she spent most of the day, I gather, cutting this up into strips. 
And when we came in for dinner that night for chow, she had put together the, with the cook a uh, sort of a meat pasta or a pasta dinner with meat sauce from our uh, canned rations. Um, that was a very impressive thing for this lady to do and also impressive for the uh, uh, cook to have rigged this up. Uh, I know in guard duty we would be out at, in the outpost at night and regularly about 9 o'clock a German uh, plane would come over and of course we all, as everyone else did, refer to the, referred to him as Bed Check Charlie, although we never did see any Germans uh, in the course of our stay there. At some point we moved out after about three weeks and we were we spent a day or two in a smaller or a larger town. And I don't know whether it was Monticatini or not, but we, among other things, were given um, uh, showers, chance to shower, and given new uniforms before we uh, uh, before we dressed again. We were liberally sprinkled with a, a white powder. It was not talcum powder, uh, and I have a feeling that it probably was DDT or some derivative uh, that was uh, to uh, prevent lice and one thing and another. Eventually, we, after uh, two or three days there, we went to another town, a little smaller town, nearer the mountains, and uh, I think this might have been Maresca, I'm not sure, uh, and at that point we saw leaflets which had been recently dropped by the Germans welcoming the 10th Mountain Division to Italy and warning us that we were going to be uh, in serious trouble if we attacked them. From there on February 20th uh, we hiked uh, onto a ridge on the uh, Belvedere Gorolescu line and as we were uh, in reserve for uh, the attack we moved along and eventually came into a a pine or chestnut tree forest uh, and came upon some uh, very well built German bunkers. Uh, as it was late, late in the day we were told to check them and move in until further notice. Uh, we did check them for booby traps and then moved in for the night. During the night there was enormous heavy shelling, the first we'd experienced and it went on and on and on and there was lots of uh, uh, attacking uh, near where we were but we never uh, were called out as we were in reserve at that point and apparently yeah, everything was under control. Uh, this is our first encounter with the uh, German 88 uh, gun artillery piece which uh, uh, has a very, very distinctive sound and is uh, high velocity in every way. Um, and uh, we could hear the explosions outside the bunkers among the trees and uh, just knew that it was it would be death to go out there with, from shrapnel and also from the splinters of the trees that would be flying around. Um, then we also at one point uh, heard something which uh, I was told was a uh, an artillery piece called a Nebelwerfer, uh, which had a very eerie whining sound and was used primarily for psychological purposes to disorient the troops uh, upon which it was fired. And until we knew what it was, we were pretty well, uh, pretty upset about it and, and very, very afraid because we didn't have a clue what it was and, and were uh, 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 pretty, pretty concerned. Eventually that all stopped, the attack, the uh, uh, artillery barrage eventually died down and the next morning when we went out we were absolutely stunned by the damage to the chestnut forest and the pines that were around. Uh, the trees were uh, scattered in all directions, huge splinters uh, obviously had f been flying around and uh, so this was a, 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 a real eye-opener for us and uh, uh, pretty sobering, I might say. Um, at some point during that morning on the 21st, we uh, spread out, our platoon spread out, and uh, company spread out along this uh, hillside, and uh, we, uh, I remember running down um, the hill through a partially wooded slope and up the other side where we stopped just uh, behind the brow of the hill. Uh, as we caught our breath, 
uh, and we were st we were on a little little road. Uh, it was probably a, a two one track uh, dirt road across the or just behind the the, the top of the hill. And we were um, crouched down behind it, and suddenly there was this enormous explosion right next to me, and uh, uh, we all ducked down and were obviously scared because we assumed we were being shelled and uh, uh, waited for the next round or two to come in and nothing happened. Uh, I looked to my immediate left and uh, uh, here uh, on my left on the ground was a GI helmet upside down rocking back and forth and nothing else. Uh, at closer inspection we found dog tags and uh, body parts of Eddie LaBelle, who had been running along next to me as we came down the hill and up the up the valley. Uh, we found his dog tags uh, later and uh, uh, sent them on back. Uh, it was determined then that uh, by our sergeant that the pin on his or the pins on his uh, grenades had worked their way loose, and one of them, or both of them, had exploded. Uh, so we were all told to check our grenades, and sure enough, some of the pins uh, were part way out, and uh, we were able to uh, put them back in and spread the ends a little. Uh, so we uh, uh, wouldn't have that problem, but that was a, a tragic mistake uh, that uh, shouldn't have happened. After a while, we moved out through the woods, and uh, eventually came to a small uh, valley, a uh, very shallow valley with hills uh, uh, ahead of us. On the right-hand hill was a stone, big stone farmhouse of one sort or another, and we assumed that because uh, the troops were moving ahead of us up the center hill uh, that that f uh, house had been checked. Uh, so we kept going and uh, crossed uh, a, a narrow area that had lots of little paths and uh, stick fences uh, looking much like a, a series of little vegetable gardens of one sort or another, uh, probably used by the local people uh, prior to the war. Uh, we kept moving across and eventually started up this hill and uh, as we got closer to the top uh, we could hear fierce fighting on the other side. Uh, we later realized or were told that we had been moving up Hill 1079 uh, en route to our objective which was Mount Della Toraccia. Uh, just as soon as we reached the uh, backside of the brow of the hill uh, we were hit with an enormous um, um, mortar attack. And the Germans knew exactly where we would be coming and had laid down uh, all kinds of fields of fire and had that thing completely covered so that we uh, underwent a, a tremendous uh, mortar barrage uh, and eventually a number of us uh, were either killed or injured. Uh, the first uh, aid uh, man came and checked me out, uh, gave me some treatment, tagged me and asked if I could walk, and I said I thought I could. Uh, I had been wounded uh, by a shrapnel uh, on the top front of my uh, right thigh, and uh, so he sent, us, sent me back along with several others, and we crawled and crept our way back down the hill uh, until we got to this little fenced-in area where the vegetable plots were. As soon as we tried to move across it, we heard the uh, familiar and terrible sound of the 88 uh, shells, uh, artillery shells coming our way. And before we knew it, uh, the shells were dropping all around us. Uh, they lifted us right off the ground. Uh, the concussion was just unbelievable. And it kept on for, I don't know, probably 45 minutes or so. Uh, every time we tried to move or crawl, uh, more shells would come in. And eventually, after going through this hell, we uh, were able to work our way, crawl uh, into the woods uh, where we met our colonel, Colonel Barlow, the regimental commander, who asked us what we were doing coming back. 
then he saw the uh, medical tags attached to our uniforms and directed us back to the aid station and wished us well. We found out later that uh, people had, were concerned about the shelling that was going on where we'd been and sent people sent some troops up to the stone house where they discovered uh, a uh, German uh, who was a forward artillery uh, observer and who had been directing the fire down into our area. Uh, he was dispatched uh, uh, with forthwith, uh, we were told. Um, I spent the night at the uh, aid station uh, and was not uh, uh, checked right away because there were many more seriously uh, wounded people than I was at that point. Um, but in the process, my leg uh, really began to swell. And uh, while they uh, saw two holes, one uh, entrance hole and one exit hole in the top of my leg, they uh, provided me with sulfa drugs and bandages and told me to wait the night out. Uh, the next morning, uh, uh, or the or day or two later, uh, after being at the aid station, I was sent back to a small group of buildings to rejoin my company uh, and platoon, who had been relieved temporarily uh, to regroup. Uh, we stayed there for uh, two or three days. I wasn't able to do a, a whole lot uh, because my leg was absolutely immobile. and. Uh, uh, I always spent most of my time lying on a cot or on a pile of barracks bags. Um, on March 5th, they returned to battle, and I was put on a uh, or in a uh, an ambulance and sent down to the 16th evacuation hospital, uh, where uh, late uh, or early that uh, the next morning, I was operated on, and when I was. Uh, recovering the next day, the uh, one of the nurses came by to say that they had pulled out several pieces of shrapnel from my leg. The only other memory I have of that really was that I was in a bunk next to a German soldier who'd been um, shot in the stomach, and uh, uh, they didn't really hold out much hope for him. And all he wanted was a drink of water, but they couldn't allow him to have that, and it was just really. Uh, really tragic and, and, and quite horrifying to hear him beg all night and all day for water, and they just couldn't give it to him. Then I was shipped down to the 64th General Hospital in, in Leghorn, and uh, they were getting ready for a big push uh, from the 10th and, and uh, others along the uh, Gothic line. And uh, the next thing you know, uh, the more or less empty tent uh, ward that I was in was filled with soldiers, 10th uh, Division people and 88th Division and others uh, from the area. Uh, and we, I stayed there for about three weeks, uh, after which uh, I was sent to a rehab uh, center at the uh, former King of Italy's uh, summer palace. Uh, in Pisa, and uh, there were some lovely buildings there which had been turned into uh, rehab centers, uh, areas for uh, tents and one thing and another, plus the King's uh, racetrack, which was a grass-covered uh, track with a grandstand and so on. And we uh, did our rehab work there, went through all the old army training films of health and one thing and another. And we're at that point in the process of, of, of getting back into marching and all that kind of thing when President Roosevelt died. And uh, we were all told that there would be a memorial service uh, um, on the day after or the day he was buried back in the States uh, at the racetrack. And we all we were out there marching, and uh, they had a ceremony of one sort, and, and wonderful band music, and hymns, and, and things of that kind, which were very impressive. And uh, uh, we were all stunned by the death of our leader. Several times during my stay at the rehab center uh, in Pisa, uh, there were races held, horse races held, uh, on the King's 
uh, grass-covered racetrack. Um, these were unusual in that the, the racehorses were Belgian draft horses, and it was really quite something to see these huge monsters thundering down the home stretch, uh, and we all certainly enjoyed that. I believe the uh, horses had been captured uh, and collected from the Germans at some point uh, earlier in the war. By this time, uh, masses of prisoners were being sent our way, and they marched slowly down the roads into the king's, uh, of the former king's summer palace, uh, completely filling the road and stretching for miles behind. Uh, the uh, palace had a number of large fields surrounding it, and uh, we strung barbed, single strands of barbed wire around these fields in different areas and herded the prisoners into uh, various sections of these compounds. Uh, they were told to sit down and wait. Food, medical supplies, and other uh, items would be provided in uh, short order. Um, they were a very sad lot. They. Uh, dragged themselves in, uh, very, very tired, uh, vacant looks in their eyes, and were very happy to sit down and just wait. Nobody tried to escape uh, during the whole time I was there. Um, there, were, uh, there was every nationality you could imagine, uh, Russians, Slavs of different orders, uh, people from the Far East, and of course the uh, German uh, so-called German uh, Superman. Those of us in the rehab center who were about ready to head back to our uh, outfits were put on guard duty, uh, uh, spaced somewhat in a scattered fashion all the way around the compound where these prisoners were held. And this we did for several days. Then uh, we were getting close to the time we would be sent back to our outfits, and we had two or three nights of, of surprise drills uh, in which they, uh, the rehab people uh, pretended that there had been an alert and people, uh, Germans or whatever, had infiltrated behind the lines and were coming up to uh, the center where we were located. And so we had to go out and uh, repel their advance. Uh, we did this for two or three times, and then uh, came time to leave. We were loaded into trucks and driven off uh, north toward the front uh, as we reached various uh, division uh, groups. Uh, various members of the uh, truckload would be uh, offloaded, and we continued our journey. Uh, one of the things that su surprised us all and really uh, sobered us tremendously was the tremendous damage, particularly in the mountains just prior to uh, entering the Po Valley. Whole towns were destroyed, uh, landscapes completely obliterated with, with, from, with trees uh, gone, the uh, trenches, uh, barbed wire, all the various things that uh, you expect to see uh, for troops dug in along the way. Uh, we crossed the Po on uh, portable bridges. And uh, in about two days, or two and a half days, I uh, joined my uh, outfit, E Company 85th, on May 1st, uh, either in Mount Chesney or Castanandola. When the war ended, uh, we were trucked around uh, to an area near Udine, uh, a town called Tricesimo. Uh, which was um, near Brescia, not too far from Brescia, at least didn't seem so. And we camped in a <clears throat> pasture outside of Tricesimo and uh, did light duty of various sorts. Uh, people were given uh, passes to Florence and uh, other areas. Um, I was asked at one point to conduct a weekly uh, review of uh, news uh, of the world to bring our uh, company up to date on various things, which I did on a regular basis. And uh, I was also given a three-day pass to uh, 
uh, Florence, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and was billeted in the main railroad station in the center of, of um, the city of Florence. Had a chance to uh, wander and see some of the sights, and actually was at one of the palaces when the famous uh, statue of David was being uh, uncrated and uh, remounted on its pedestal outside the palace. Uh, also, at another point, <clears throat> I had I was one of a group of of Tenth uh, Mountain people to go to Trieste as an exchange uh, with. Uh, so, sailors from um, um, the Ajax cruiser, uh, the British cruiser Ajax, uh, and they came up and stayed with us for uh, two or three days. Uh, also, I had a chance uh, with uh, our whole company went up to uh, the Dolomites to watch some of the uh, ski races that the Tenth Mountain uh, put on. Uh, then, <clears throat> perhaps in the second week in July, uh, we boarded boxcars and made our way down uh, Italy, stopping briefly at uh, Rome, uh, we could, which we could see from the boxcar, and uh, uh, wound up again in Naples, where we were put in a um, sort of a uh, barrack situation, uh, which was uh, a rest area, really, uh, while we waited for our transport back to the States. The Red Cross was uh, very accommodating. Uh, there were a variety of different things to do. We could not leave the area, however, and uh, so spent the time uh, just uh, visiting uh, with our colleagues and uh, getting ready for the trip back home. Before long, our transportation arrived, and on or around the 31st of July, we boarded the motor ship uh, uh, Marine Fox and sailed for the United States via the Azores and the Sargasso Sea. We, uh, several days out from New York, arrival in New York, uh, we were told that President Truman was going to speak on the PA system, and uh, when he did, he uh, mentioned dropping a, a bomb of some sort on Hiroshima in Japan, and a day or so later, another one on Nagasaki. Um, we uh, didn't have a clue what he was talking about, but our uh, officers tried to explain as best they could what an atomic bomb was. Uh, we were uh, chatting about that quite a bit on the way back, and when we did arrive in New York City on the 11th of August, uh, we sailed up the Hudson River early in the morning. Uh, and it, even at that time, there were hundreds of hundreds of people uh, lining the Henry Hudson Parkway uh, and blowing horns, waving and cheering and waving flags and so on. And of course, all of us wanted to be on that side of the ship, the Manhattan side of the ship, so we all moved over that way and the ship began to uh, list considerably. Uh, to the point where the captain came on the PA system and told us to trim the ship, otherwise we would never make it to the uh, to go under the uh, George Washington Bridge. After a few hours, we uh, disembarked at Camp Shanks, further up the Hudson River, and were given a 30-day fur furlough and told to report back to Camp Carson, uh, Colorado, at the end of that time. Uh, we remained at Carson. Uh, until roughly November 30th when the division was deactivated. And at that point, uh, because of my uh, number of points that I had accumulated, I was sent to Camp Campbell, Kentucky, uh, until I was discharged uh, from Indian Town Gap on February 2nd, 1946. Uh, shortly after my discharge, I uh, joined the 10th Mountain uh, Division Association uh, and still have card number 227. Uh, after a while, I did leave, let, let my uh, membership lapse, mainly because my work schedule did not coordinate with the activities uh, of the division. I have since renewed uh, my membership after my retirement and am currently a member at the present time. Um, I went back to uh, college, 
and uh, uh, finished up and in 1950 began teaching, uh, taught uh, fourth through ninth grades, ecology and conservation, which uh, uh, was a new course and which uh, a lot of people hadn't even given much thought to up to that time. Um, then uh, I was uh, asked to join the National Audubon Society. I had worked for them in the summers uh, during my college after, after discharge and uh, uh, worked at adult training camps uh, up in Maine and was able to uh, pick up uh, quite a bit of experience and knowledge that way and of course knew the, knew the people uh, on the staff very well. So that in uh, uh, the early 50s, I was asked to, or the late 50s, I was asked to join the National Audubon Society and direct one of the educational centers uh, which they had in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, during the first weeks or so of that, I uh, was involved in setting up a uh, symposium on DDT and its effects and so on. And in the course of the uh, meeting, met some of the uh, top executive people of various conservation groups across the country. One of them was Dave Brower, who had been in the 10th Mountain Division. But unfortunately, we never had a chance to talk and, and uh, get um, uh, the 10th Mountain Connection uh, tied together. And unfortunately, I also, I never saw him again after that meeting. I did, however, uh, meet and work with a former 10th Mountain Division uh, man, uh, Bob Boardman, who was a public information officer for National Audubon. And he had been uh, stationed uh, in West Virginia uh, during the uh, program that they ran down there and eventually was hooked up with us uh, as we went to Italy. Um, and actually his office was right next to mine uh, when I was working in the New York office. I retired in 1980 as a vice president of education for the society and uh, went back to teaching for several years before I had a very serious illness and had to uh, retire completely. I feel very lucky that uh, uh, my battle experience was uh, limited and I really didn't suffer the transitional uh, experiences that many of my uh, colleagues did uh, when they moved from the military back to civilian life. During my time with the 10th, I met many wonderful people and formed lifelong friendships with a number of them, and we still keep in touch. Our initial love of the outdoors wasn't dimmed by our training or our war experiences. In fact, it was probably increased, uh, and I'm not surprised that uh, many of uh, the people I met and knew uh, became professionally involved in, or even as an avocation uh, in conservation organizations across the country, or who produced and built these marvelous ski resorts which we all enjoy and have enjoyed over the years. The men of the 10th were uh, very special people both during and after the war, and I'm certainly proud to have been part of that group.